This is Adrienne Shales, president of Baylor University Women's Council in Atlanta. And I welcome you to this very special time together with Susie Mile. She is the creator and founder of the website and blog, Empty Nest Blessed. And there she focuses on different things such as fashion, wellness, beauty, um, health, fitness, and um, it's really for anybody, but it focuses on um, empty nesters, soon to be empty nesters, or even new empty nesters. I met Susie about a year and a half ago on campus, and I am so glad I met her. When I met her, she truly um, gave out what she's about to talk about now, cultivating a heart of joy. Susie truly is full of joy. When I met her, I felt the joy. And so, as I got to know her more, and as a, a mama bear myself, we have a freshman at Baylor University, but before we launched him, I knew that Susie taught and shared and spoke about launching our seniors into college life. So I contacted Susie and she was so generous with her time. She spent some time with me going over some key things that we need to know before we launch our students into college. And it really was such an endearing time to me. I have shared what she taught me with other mamas who are launching their students into life after the age of 18. And even recently, I went to her blog to read what she said, how, what are six ways you can love your adult children. So Susie is always putting out great creative content on things that are important to women, our health, um, our fitness, our wellness, our families, and prayer. She is a woman of faith, and what she's going to share today will really encourage your faith. So I wanted to pray before we get started. I also wanted to thank you, all of you who have um, helped behind the scenes. Uh, Tess Jameson is a great help from Baylor alumni staff with all the technical things. We have Virginia Ellis on, who's the senior director of our women's programs at Baylor with the Women's Council. So thank you, ladies, and the rest of the Baylor alumni staff. I want to thank our council here in Atlanta for helping put this on. Amy Hollingsworth, Jeanette Severson, and Katie Beecham. They are our vice president and our other two chairs. And it's just really great to be together today. We have women from around the country joining us. I love that we can do that and encourage one another. And even though we can't see each other and hang out, I tell you, every time I'm done with one of these Zoom calls, I feel so uplifted and encouraged. And you know what? Today, I'm probably going to have more joy than usual from what <laughs> I learned. So I want to welcome you for um, our time with Susie. Father God, I thank you for Susie. I thank you for the work that you do in her and through her. We just open up our hearts to you to receive the goodness of understanding how to cultivate a heart of joy. So let's welcome Susie. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for that. And you, um, you are a woman who radiates joy. So I, I know where that comes from. So thank you for that sweet introduction. You guys, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, what a privilege. I wish that I could be with you in person. Oh, so much. But um, that's not God's plan for right now. So we're going to learn about having joy in spite of things not always going the way we want them to. And um, I'm just so excited to share this message with you today. So um, I want you to start off by thinking about when was the last time that you felt complete and total joy? Like seriously, like 100% joy. So if you're honest, it may be difficult to really think of the last time you felt pure, unadulterated joy. So I can tell you when it was for me. So for me, maybe you relate. It was when the men's basketball team won the NCAA national championship. So I'm going to paint it for you. Here's the picture. Bob and I were in our PJs with our Baylor sweatshirts on top, of course, in front of the TV. And we were dancing and jumping around like nobody's business. And you guys, I turned to Bob and I said, everything else has faded away. And at this moment, I feel total and pure joy. But did I really? Now, was that really joy or was it just happiness? So we all want more joy. 
And the question we're going to answer today is, can you cultivate a joyful heart? And if so, how? So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to run down what joy is. I'm going to share 10 practical tips to up your joy factor. And I'm going to tell you how to avoid the joy stealers in life. And finally, how to find joy even in the most devastating circumstances. And at the very end, I'm going to tell you whether what I felt in that moment when the men won the championship was true joy or not. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so let's get started by breaking down joy and figuring out what it is and what it isn't. Well, you've probably all heard, okay, that joy is not the same thing as happiness. And that's true. Happiness is an emotion. Emotions are, are natural reactions to life events, circumstances, and situations in our lives. So while we might love the high that we get from happiness, true joy is steady and dependable. There's a great C.S. Lewis quote that I love. C.S. Lewis once said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. You guys, happiness is great. And sometimes it can even be a gateway to joy, but true joy goes way deeper. It's so much better. It is that holiday at the sea. Okay, true joy is only from the Lord. You can't have a heart of joy if you don't know the Lord because true joy stems from heartfelt gratitude for God's love, mercy, and grace. And you guys, joy is always, always intertwined with gratitude, always. Okay, so what does the Bible say about joy? Let's look at that really quick. So years ago, y'all, I decided to do a word study of the word joy in the Bible. And I did not have any idea what I was getting myself into, but it took a really long time, like months. Um, I This is what I did. I literally looked up every single reference to joy in scripture, and then I wrote down what the Bible said about it. And y'all, I almost filled up an entire notebook. Nehemiah 8.10 says this, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Proverbs 10.28, the prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. You guys, we're only righteous because in the most amazing and undeserved exchange in history, Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself when he died on the cross for us, and he clothed us with his righteousness in exchange. It's amazing. That is the root of our joy. Our gratitude for that, because gratitude is always intertwined with joy. They always go together. In fact, in Hebrews 12, 2, the Bible tells us that Christ actually endured the cross and the scorning it brought because of the joy set before him, what he could look forward to, in sitting at the right hand of his father's throne. Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So some people say, that happiness, you may have heard this, happiness is circumstantial, but joy is not. And I will tell you, I do not necessarily agree after studying what the Bible says. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it's also clear in scripture that sometimes joy is actually tied to life events. But probably not in the way you think. As Christians, we don't just glean joy from a circumstance, a life event, or a situation in and of itself. Rather, we glean joy from a circumstance, life event, or situation because we know the one who made things happen. For example, so anyone can appreciate and enjoy the beauty of a sunset, the grandeur of the mountains, or the crashing waves on a beach. But as Christians, we're the ones who truly glean joy from those things. Why? Because we know the one who made them happen. 
He's our father, our friend, and our savior. Isaiah 9, 3 says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. In that verse, we see joy tied to something God did for his people. He enlarged the nation. That's circumstantial, but God did it. 2 John 1.12 says this. This is John speaking. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be complete. So you guys, in that verse, we see John anticipating the joy of being face to face with his friends, which is something we can all relate to right now. I wish I was face to face with you. In both examples, what we see is that joy is intertwined with gratitude. You guys, grateful people are joyful people. Gratitude for what Christ did for us on the cross, gratitude for the fact that he did it when we didn't deserve it, and gratitude for what he continues to do in our lives. The secret to cultivating joy, it's gratitude. Okay, let's talk about how you can cultivate a heart of joy. So because joy and by default gratitude are muscles that get stronger with use, you're going to have to be intentional about pursuing joy, practicing joy, and cultivating a heart of joy. So let's talk about what that looks like on a practical level. I'm all about being practical. First of all, since you can't know how to get somewhere without knowing where you're going, if you're serious about wanting more joy in your life, I would highly recommend that you do a word study of the word joy in the Bible, as I did. Knowing and understanding what God says about joy is really the key to cultivating it. So next, you're going to intentionally and actively pursue it and practice it, and you're always going to intertwine it with gratitude. Okay, I'm going to tell you 10 really great practical tips for cultivating a heart of joy. I hope they're really great. They've worked for me. Okay, number one, make an effort to laugh more, especially at yourself. Proverbs 12, 22, you all know it. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. So y'all, multiple studies, including one out of UC Irvine, have shown that laughter reduces stress hormone secretion and actually helps the immune system defend itself against viruses, bacteria, cancer, and heart disease. Simply put, laughter is good medicine. It's important not to take ourselves too seriously, and y'all, Laugh at yourself whenever possible. Here's a great story about me. <laughs> One time um, I was writing a quick email to someone in the Baylor Development Office about a donation that Bob and I were giving to Baylor. And in fact, I was right, I do things quickly, and I was writing the email so quickly, y'all, that instead of signing our names, Susie and Bob, Susie, S U Z Y and Bob. I typed S-U-X-Y, sexy, and bib, B-I-B, -B, sexy and bibs. <laughs> and then I hit send, just sexy and bib. Here you go. Here's your donation. <laughs> I was mortified. And of course, then I wrote an email apologizing and saying how mortified I was. But then I just started laughing. And then I started telling that story to just anyone who would listen and I haven't stopped. <laughs> oh, anyway, laugh at yourself whenever possible. It's so much better than laughing at others. Okay, number two, if we're talking about ways to cultivate joy practically, plan something to look forward to. So in that same study out of UC Irvine that I just was telling you about, researchers found that the mere anticipation of laughing helped decrease the stress markers of the participants in the study. So they even coined what they discovered, the biology of hope. I think that's so interesting. This is what they did. So they took a group of men, they measured their stress signs, and then they told them they would be watching a humorous video in three days. And guess what happened? The man, men's stress markers started dropping immediately. Then two days before the viewing, they found that depression was down 81%, anger 19%, fatigue 15%,
and tension 9%. That was two days before the viewing. Right after the viewing, depression and anger were both down 98%, fatigue 87%, and tension 61% just because they were looking forward to it. And then it happened and it was even more wonderful. So some of the tried and true advice that I always give to new empty nesters is to plan a trip within a week or two of your last child leaving. It gives you something to look forward to and focus on besides the just challenge that it can be when your nest empties and make you make that transition because it just gives you something to look forward to. It gives you a chance to press the reset button on your life in a relaxed and fun setting. But you probably know, y'all, having something to look forward to, it's true for anyone in any stage of life. And Bob and I try to always have something fun to look forward to at all times, whether it's just a date night or a weekend getaway. Romans 15, 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is power in hope. Number three, in terms of being practical, y'all, this is a silly one, but it works. Sprinkle some positivity into your daily life. Do something little, like changing your passwords to something joyful and grateful, like I don't know, Grateful Gal 21 or I Choose Joy 82. Studies have actually found that small acts of affirmation actually activate the reward centers in our brains. Okay, number four, figure out what makes you happy. Remember I told you that happiness when intertwined with gratitude can be a gateway to joy. Really take the time to figure out what makes you happy. And it doesn't matter if it's weird, you guys. Like I, for some reason, really love laundry. I don't know. I like doing laundry. It's something about it goes in dirty and it comes out clean and it's completed. I just like it. So two weeks ago, our old washing machine, which had been on its last legs for a long time, it finally gave out and I was pretty excited. I got a new washing machine and y'all, it's the greatest thing. <laughs> I am so grateful for that new washing machine and I'm having the best time doing a lot of laundry. I am sorry, laundry makes me happy. It is weird, but what happened? I got a new washing machine and there was the gratitude that intertwined with my happiness and there was the joy because gratitude's always intertwined with joy. Okay, number five, create a positivity playlist. Playlist. Okay, so they've shown, multiple studies have shown that music releases a chemical in your brain called dopamine, which improves your mood and reduces anxiety. And it can also help produce the stress reducing hormone cortisol. So it induces pleasure, positivity, and motivation. According to psychologists, the most emotionally invigorating tunes have positive lyrics in a tempo of about 150 beats per minute. So you should just go to Spotify immediately and look for an upbeat playlist or make your own with like 10 to 20 songs that you can throw on when you need a little motivation or when you're going for a walk. Okay, number six make an effort to smile more. So studies have proven that there's actually a link between your facial expression and your mood. When you smile, your brain releases neuropeptides, which combat stress. Other natural antidepressant neurotransmitters also get involved like dopamine, serotonin, and endorphins. So by making yourself smile, you're actually activating an area in the brain that is switched on when you're joyful. If you're feeling kind of down, make yourself smile. You will, you will be amazed at the change in your mood. Okay, number seven, celebrate everything. Be sure that you stop and celebrate with gratitude the joyful events in your life, big or small. Um, maybe you're like me and you're just always going and going and it's tempting to go on to the next thing, but don't do it, you guys. Um, stop and celebrate, even the little things, big and little. Okay, number eight, worship. So true worship stems from a heart of joy. 
Worship is just acknowledging who God is and who we are. And then it's acknowledging that only he could bridge the divide between us. Gratitude is always intertwined with joy. Joy is always intertwined with worship. Get yourself to a worship service on Sundays. Listen to worship music and make sure that worship is a part of your prayer life. So worship, not to confuse it with thankfulness, which is an important part of your prayer life too, but worship is really praising him for who he is. Um, there are great Bible studies out there on this, but a great tool can be to study the names of God in scripture and then use those to praise him and worship him. Got to worship. Number nine, guard your heart and your mind. Okay, if we polled five people in your life who know your heart and your mind and really know you well, would they call you a positive person or a negative person? Would they say that you have a heart of joy? Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Proverbs 17.22 says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Remember that one? You want to know if you have a heart of joy? Scripture provides us with a fail-proof test that can tell you what is coming out of your mouth. Luke 6.45 says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. That's the test. Ephesians 4.29 tells us what those words should be that are coming out of our mouths. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It's Ephesians 4.29. So our words should be, number one, According to that verse, positive, inspiring, and encouraging. Number two, appropriate to the moment, the person, and the context of the situation. Number three, beneficial, helpful, and a blessing. All right, number 10, actively practice the discipline of gratitude. Grateful people are joyful people. If you want to cultivate a heart of joy, write down three things that you're grateful for at the end of each day. Make them specific and unique to that day to illuminate the pockets of joy that have been hidden throughout your day. Like um, my adult kid reached out to me to ask for advice. That's something to rejoice about, <laughs> at least in my life. It is. <laughs> Avoid things that are repetitive when you're making these lists. Things like, um, I'm grateful for my family or or I'm grateful for the beautiful weather. Be really specific and make yourself do that. So I have a gratitude to-do list pad. Look at this. I'm so excited. I can share this. And since it's on the screen, you can see it, y'all. This is a gratitude to-do list pad that I use every night when I make my to-do list for the next day. It's from one of my favorite small businesses. And you see at the top, it has three blanks where you can say what I'm most grateful for. Then it has the top three things you need to do. Then it has everything else. And it's a notepad. So I use this every single day. I thought it would be fun to give some of those away today. So when we're finished here, if you go to emptinessblessed.com, you will see a blog post that is an excerpt of this talk that I am sharing with you. It has all the Bible verses that I'm sharing and um, all the main points that I'm hitting. And also you will find an opportunity to win one of five of these terrific gratitude to-do list. They're just a great practical tool. So incorporate practical tools like that in your life um, to help you with joy. Okay, let's talk about joy stealers because sometimes you can feel like you're on target with that joy, but things want to steal it. <laughs> so you gotta be aware of the joy stealers. Now, pretty much these could be other people or you could be stealing your own joy. 
Let's talk about that. Okay. Are you your own joy stealer? Well, I will tell you that it is hard to have a heart of joy when you're looking horizontally and not vertically. When you look at other people, either in real life or on social media, do you assume that their lives are perfect? Trust me, they are not. Everybody has something and probably lots of some things. So you guys, this happens to me all the time because people that follow me on Instagram or Facebook think they know me. And the truth is they don't, not really. I mean, I strive to be as authentic as possible, but you guys, my life is not perfect. I, I have a happy marriage. I have kids that are following the Lord and I have a great career and a job that I love that started after my kids left the nest. But you know what? I struggle with work-life balance. I have health issues that affect my life every single day. And I also have some difficult relationships in my life. I have not hidden those things. And I've tried to be authentic. And I've talked about the ones that wouldn't invade somebody else's privacy. But y'all, those things aren't visible from the outside. Um, just remember and tell yourself the truth. Everybody has something, whether you can see it or not. If you want to cultivate a heart of joy, you need to call out the lies that you may be telling yourself and put them to death. Scripture is clear about where lies come from. The lies you're telling yourself about others and the lies you may be telling yourself about yourself. Where do lies come from? John 8, 44 says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he's a liar and the father of lies. Don't buy into the lies. Okay, number two, who's stealing joy? Look out for negative people who try to steal your joy. I love the Eleanor Roosevelt quote. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Are you giving consent to someone? Please don't do it. Please don't. Don't let anyone steal your joy. People's unkind and negative reactions to you are usually more about them than about you. Hurting people are the ones who need to hurt others. Some people will always Look for what they perceive as a negative in anything you do or say, despite your true meaning or intent. Matthew 5, says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Those people could be jealous of who they think you are, or they might feel that by putting you down, they'll feel better about themselves. Remember, just as I said, they don't know everything about you. They're hurting and they need your prayers. All right, well, let's talk about how you can find joy in a devastating situation. Psalm 35 says, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Even when we're in a time of sorrow, Joy comes in the morning. It's right around the corner. When you feel like you'll never have joy again, those words should bring you comfort and hope. You need to know that joy can coexist with other feelings, emotions, and thoughts. Seeing the joy in a devastating situation does not negate the sadness that you feel. Huh, this is a hard story to tell. A year ago, my precious daughter-in-law, um, who's a Baylor grad, Sarah, her best friend died suddenly and unexpectedly. As Sarah grieved, she said she realized that her sadness lived side by side with the joy that her best friend was in heaven and they, she would see her again. You can hold them both together. And that was somewhat of a revelation to Sarah. It gave her such gratitude for the Lord's promise of heaven and the hope that it brings in a time of grief. Do you see it? 
there's gratitude again, joy, always intertwined with gratitude. Scientists have found that genuinely joyful people are what they call emo diverse, emo for emotions. That means that they can manage all different emotions and feelings at once. The reason joyful people, their feelings go deeper. Okay, how else can we cope in a devastating situation? You need to know that we're commanded to have joy and gratitude, commanded. Yep, in a seemingly odd turn of events in scripture, you guys, we're actually commanded to have a heart of joy and to give thanks in trials and difficulties. Wait, what? I mean, really? Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Of course, that's James 1, 2. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Joy, always intertwined with gratitude. Number three, when you're in a devastating situation, know that you actively need to look for the joy actively. When you're in a devastating, life-shattering situation, look for the kindness and mercy of God. He is walking with you in your difficult situation, and he's going to demonstrate that to you. You need to look for it. Maybe he'll change your circumstances. Maybe he'll use his people to pour out his grace in your life. If any of you have ever been in a life-altering, devastating situation, you know what I'm talking about here. To be the recipient of the body of Christ wrapping their arms around you and lifting you up is a privilege that makes an indelible mark. When we were in a situation like that, I told my husband, I would never wish our situation on another person. But you know what I do wish? I wish everyone could be the recipient of the outpouring of grace that we've received from the body of Christ during this time. Y'all, that outpouring was a beautiful, sacred infusion of joy in the midst of devastation. And as always, there was gratitude for it because gratitude is always, always intertwined with joy. So when the Baylor men's basketball team won the national championship and I turned to my husband and told him I felt pure joy, did I really? Was that joy? Yes, it was. Because I know the one they play for. Head coach Scott Drew has been open about the fact that he cultivates a culture of joy in his program. He encourages a humble, consider others more important than yourself mindset in his players. And my joy was intertwined with gratitude for those young men, respect for their hard work and their desire to honor, glorify, and point to the Father in their play. We know their hearts, but more importantly, we know the one they play for. And we're grateful and joyful. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much. And I want to ask Adrian to come back on and see if you guys had any questions, if there's anything you want me to clarify. Um, hi, beautiful Adrian. What do you oh, have? Hi. Well, I have enjoyed this so much. And I wish you could have seen me laughing while you're sharing. <laughs> that and Bib, I, I was laughing here all by myself. <laughs> hi, I'm Suxy. Hi, yeah. Bib. I'm glad you didn't misspell it any worse than that. <laughs> that could have been really, really embarrassing. <laughs> So um, we do have some questions. Great. And one question is, and we've got several here. Okay. When you do, you have a go-to fun song? Like I'm thinking, you know, when I need to pet me up, I love listening to the Bee Gees "Staying Alive." Um, yes, that's a good one. That's a good one. Do you have any favorite songs that you are have go-to songs? I have several and some I would be embarrassed to tell you <laughs> and um, I really love y'all I love talk about weird things that make you happy I love Toby Mac 
I don't know. He's like a rapper, but he's also like our age and he's still really cool. And um, he's very fun in concert. I make Bob take me every time he comes into town, which is a lot. He, he tours a lot. Um, I like his music so much. He has um, suffered a devastating situation and he's a great example of someone who's chosen joy. His son, um, I think committed suicide a couple of years ago and um, it was a sudden and unexpected death and he grieved through that and has the music he's shared even since then has been so inspiring. So I love Toby Mac. So yes. I just hit my Toby Mac playlist pretty much. Okay. Yeah. I was listening to it this morning. Do you dance in the house when no one's watching? Oh, of course. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's one of the best things. Don't tell anybody. It's one of the best things about being an empty nester. Yes. You can, you can dance or do whatever. Yes. That's it. That's it's fine. Great. Yeah. Uh, one of your other points that you brought up was mm -hmm. about um, celebrating everything. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we have, do you have any examples of any small celebration that you like to do for yourself? You know, maybe it's you grab a special cupcake or what's yeah. some, you're very busy, you're multitask. And I know you said you have to make yourself stop and celebrate. What are some little things you like to do to celebrate? So I'm kind of weird. Like, um, I just like to do crazy stuff. So like just go, sometimes it's like going to eat an in and out burger because <laughs> I, because I like a burger and fries every once in a while, or, um, it might be just going for a walk or going to get ice cream or just let's get in the pool after dinner or just something small, but celebratory that feels like this would be fun to do that would be unusual that's just celebratory so I'm not a big one on what's called self-care like I feel like I care for myself plenty and so I mean I'll you know do a bubble bath or whatever but when I want to celebrate I usually want to go out um and do something fun with Bob so yeah, yeah. so yeah. our daughter um who's been living with us during the pandemic um, just left yesterday on a plane for um, a summer job thing that she's got. And so we went to In-N-Out Burger to celebrate. <laughs> Emptiness Blessed is back. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Things that are a little out of the ordinary is what you're talking about. Something Exactly. Really exactly. Okay. So another question, one of your points was plan something to look forward to. And I know during the pandemic, many of our plans came to a complete halt. Yeah. Any ideas on little things to look forward to that, you, that we can plan that maybe yes. uh, did during the pandemic or would suggest when we can't get out and about as much as we would like to? That's a great question. So I hope that you guys are doing what we're doing and planning to get out there a little bit more now. Um, if you've been vaccinated or whatever and just plan a little getaway or something like that. Um, I will tell you that Bob and I have gone to the movies several time and, times, and I think it's safer than at our house because nobody's there, y'all. So <laughs> if you can find a good movie that you want to go see, go to the movies and just get a giant bucket of popcorn and just eat it, and it'll be super fun. Or do what we do, which is we go to the movies and buy, they have this giant, at Cinemark, they have this giant bag called Pack-A-Pop, and it's it's huge, y'all. It's full of popcorn. And then we bring it home and we put like a big blanket over our bed and we eat it in our bed and watch a movie. <laughs> we have picnics in the bed a lot. We're big on picnics in the bed. And um, I do not know why. We just, we just get in our giant bed with our pillows and we watch something and it might be sports. It might be a movie. And we have fajitas in the bed at least once a week. We just get them from Cantina Laredo. It just Oh, like today's May the 5th. We might have to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> Think of the Mayo. <laughs> That's a great idea. You know, now that your um, nest is empty, you can do yeah. all sorts of things that you wouldn't want your kids doing, like eating fajitas in their bed, I'm sure. Correct. <laughs> correct. That is correct. That's correct. Dancing mm -hmm. around the house. Exactly. Well, exactly. It just helps to get the creative juices flowing. Well, you know, what is Susie? Yeah. That'll trigger something in other people's minds. Yeah. So another question we have is, when things get really difficult, ex external circumstances are coming your way that are very difficult. Do you have like a go-to positive thought that you've just trained yourself to go to to kind of get the juices rolling? Um, it's grat gratitude. It's gratitude. Okay. 
So you have to train yourself. It's a muscle. Gratitude is a muscle like positivity. You have to train yourself to look for it. That's why this is so helpful because it becomes a discipline every day that the first things before my to-do list are gratitude. So you do have to train yourself to look for it. So even in the most devastating situation, look for the gratitude. It might be so small. It might be the flower and the crack on the sidewalk. I don't know. It it just can be the smallest thing. It might be you have a good hair day. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, it can be the smallest thing. But look for the joy. Um, really, a good hair day. That's not very good. <laughs> oh, but but look, for, <laughs> look for the little ways that yeah. you see the Lord walking with you. Yeah. And, um, and be grateful. And there are times that um, have been devastating that just a comfort in, oh, I'm really just thankful to have Diet Dr. Pepper because <laughs> I really love it. And I'm actually grateful for it. It makes me happy, but happiness can be a gateway to joy. Yeah. So when you intertwine happiness with gratitude, you've got it. So that's the secret. The secret yeah. is gratitude. Yes. That's very helpful. So I have another question. And also, if any of you listening and watching, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. And if I can get to them, we will ask Susie these questions. So here's another one. Okay. There are times people try to steal our joy. And I remember during some of my pregnancies, it seemed like I was a magnet for everybody's worst birthing story. And I was just not like, so I had this go-to phrase. And I want to ask you about if you have a go-to phrase, this was just during my pregnancy. I say, oh, just positive stories, please. And they would be like, oh, and um, when people try to steal your joy, and I know you being um, a social media influencer, like you said, people, they know you and they know you to some degree, but they also, I, I don't know, I can't imagine anybody negative comments on your blog or emailing you anything negative, but if they ever do. Like, how do you handle that on the inside? Because that's really hard to hear. You know, you put your life out there. You put a lot of work into it. You're trying to encourage people. And somebody comes back and says something ugly. Do you have any go-to phrases you pep yourself up with? Or they actually that you'd even say to somebody if it was in person? Yeah, that's a great question. I love what you say. I think that's wonderful. And, um, you know, honestly, I try to think about where the person is coming from. So like thinking about the people telling you their negative birth stories, are they like, I'm going to tell her so I can you know, help her get prepared if something happens or, I mean, you know, what's their reason? And so a lot of what I try to do is just to speak truth to myself, like I shared with you guys and remind myself hurting people are the ones who need to hurt others or they're misunderstanding my intent. And sometimes it helps me take a good look at myself and to see what's, what's happening that's different from what my intent was in communicating to how it was received. How could what I thought I was very intentional about communicating, how was that received wrongly? And do I need to change or tweak something? So I think having a heart of humility in it too um, for me, in my situation, I do try to look at myself and it hurts. I mean, it hurts. And sometimes I call my husband, I go, listen to what someone said, or I make him look at it. And he, he, he gets like incensed on my behalf and that sort of helps me. <laughs> so if you have like your mom or your best friend who will get incensed on your behalf and be like, that's horrible. That's just awful. And of course, the people commenting on my stuff, I don't know them. And um, I just do know that speaking truth, knowing that hurting people are the ones that hurt others. People can be jealous. They can be um, sad. They are hurting and they need your prayer. And so I try to stop and pray for them immediately. And then I just try to answer back just in a gracious, kind manner. And if I can't say very much nice, I just say, thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And that's it. Okay. So um, I, I feel like sometimes my response to people is something then other people will look at. And so I want to be an example of living out graciousness and kindness in my response. Mm -hmm. that wow. Well, I think it's probably something that 
is help, helpful that you can talk to Bob about it, kind of work through the feelings and then yeah. regroup. A really nice positive comment that will educate them on this is how we respond. So I'm, I'm really impressed you could do that because I know it can feel really personal at times. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like, just remind one. yourself they don't know you. They don't know you. Yeah. Um, another question is okay. with um, your study on joy yeah. and um, all those scriptures were very meaningful. Is there a way that you like to keep those scriptures in front of you? Are you a sticky note person? Do you like to memorize it? Do you copy it out? Do you like to sing it? Like, how do you keep those scriptures in front of you in your life? Or that question. Other that is a great question. I will tell you there is a new app that I'm using, and I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm going to look it up. It's called the Verses app. Verses, just like Bible verse, Verses. And um, it is great for memorizing scripture. So that has been something really practical and helpful that I've loved. Um, I keep it in the notebook. And um, on the blog post that I wrote that goes along with our talk today, um, on emptinessblessed.com, I share with you a notebook that I use that love, that I love from that same small business that made these. And um it's just on the front, it says gratitude is the best attitude. And um, I, I don't, I just, I write them in there. I record them and then I go back and look at them and, you know, his mercies are new every morning. Scripture is living and active. And when we're in it, he gives us, it's like manna. He gives us what we need for the day and um, he'll give you what you need. So sometimes it's by looking back. Sometimes it's just the Lord will bring something to my heart. Sometimes it's a worship song. Um, he's, he's right there. You know, when another great study, not to give you guys all these, all these studies, you're going to be like, I'm set for the next two years. But another great study is to look at every mention of the Holy Spirit in scripture and really see all of the functions of the Holy Spirit. He's comforter, he's guide, but you know, it says he's our teacher too. The Holy Spirit will teach you. And um, anyway, another great study. So now you're going to look up joy. You're going to look up the names of God. And you're going to look up the functions of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you're good for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just really so helpful. What I enjoy about your blogging, and I've talked to my husband about this, is that you give even example sentences when you're like um, talking to your adult children. Yeah. Because many times, you know, we haven't been through this before. We've never been an empty nester before. We've never been a parent before. So I think your your um, talent of bringing forth those little example sentences is just to get the ball rolling. And um, that's something I was very thankful. I was talking to my husband the other day and we we're trying to help one of our kids figure out something that just isn't natural to him. And I said, well, this is what Susie does. Susie gives these little example sentences. You fill in the blank just to get it rolling. So we started doing that with our son. So here's a phrase that you could say in this situation. And um, this is what you've done. And it helped him see here's an actual way to do something that he had no experience doing. And so I really appreciate I'm a practical person too. So I have notes of all your 10 things we all did. And it's been very helpful to have these 10 practical things look at even what joy stealers are. And you know what? I think most of us didn't consider we could be our own joy stealer. Yeah. So that's really, really important and um, really helpful. Joy and gratitude are intertwined. Nice. Uh, we loved how you said that again and again, because that is what we have to remember because maybe the joy is not there as easily because we haven't done the gratitude. And so it can kind of be like a, a kickstart to get to the joy happiness can be a kickstart to get to the joy. Well, our people have really enjoyed and had joy. And I really wish we could be in person so you could see our faces and the joy that you brought us today. So we're about to wrap up and um, I don't have any more questions coming in. I got all the ones asked and I just want to thank you. I am so thankful for you and what you've brought. And we've recorded this so it should be able to be reviewed by other people. And please go to Empty Nest Blessed. I go there looking for fashion ideas. Um, I saw you were on TikTok even showing us how you make your salads. Was that TikTok? 
no, I don't do TikTok. I'm not tech savvy enough for TikTok. My my assistant wants me to be on TikTok, but I'm like, no, no, that was on that was Instagram Reels, yeah, which is sort of the same thing on Instagram. But yeah, and um, I like how you even help um, us mamas figure out how to be tech savvy. You've got info on how to do that. Um, different um, finds that you have favorite finds for the month. So please go to Empty Nest Blessed and enjoy what our alumna, Susie Mile, is doing in the world. And I hope more people find out about you because you have been such a blessing to my family. Thank you. And to our Baylor community. So from Baylor University Women's Council of Atlanta, we thank you, we hug you, and thank you so much for your investment. And all of you that are on there, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be doing more this year and next year, I'm sure, hopefully one day in person. And maybe one day we'll see Susie in Atlanta. That'll be great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful wow. day.